Welcome everyone to the Virtual Excel Academy. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are. We're with you too and we're excited today to have a fun interactive session learning about my eye with Cindy Bachover, our hostesses of the day from Paz to Literacy. Charlotte, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Leanne from APH. And I'll say good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and I am Cheryl Kamehanan with my assistant, Amaya. Morning. Good morning. <laughs> and Cindy Bachover, do you want to give a wave before I announce the things that we should have at home? Say hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> All right, and a few things. We made a couple of announcements about today's session. If you have not heard or seen the list of materials and you have a moment to go grab a few things, we'd like to, for you to have a few things on hand. So can you please rummage through your cabinets and see if you could find a bowl, something like this maybe, or like this, we have a paper one and a plastic one. You will also need a piece of paper. We have a nice dark piece of paper we're gonna use and a pipe cleaner, and a straw, there's a straw, a black straw for us, and a ball. We need a couple of different balls, a squishy one, so we're gonna just use a cotton ball because we couldn't find a squishy ball, a Ziploc bag, and a larger ball. We didn't have a large ball in our house, what we had though was a volleyball, so we're gonna use that. And these are very curious items, Cindy. So will you tell us, I hopefully soon, what we're gonna use them for? Oh, one last thing, and a washcloth. All right, thank you, Assistant, for showing our materials. If you have a moment, go gather your materials. In the meantime, if you are with us, please let us know, who are you, where are you from, and how are you today? We're excited that you're here with us in the chat window. Let us know who you are, where you're from, Hello, Savannah from Florida. Hello, Giselles from Puerto Rico. Hello, Texas and Pennsylvania. Hi, Ryan. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Kelly. Valerie from Boston. Welcome, Jane from Mississippi. We are excited to have all of you with us. Cindy, tell us what we're going to do with all these fun materials today. We are going to build an eyeball. And before we build it, we're going to learn a little about the parts and what the uh, what we call those parts of the eye. There's just so much cool stuff. Well, we're excited. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, if you also um, a couple more items, if they're easy to grab, a magnifier and a magnifying mirror, if you have one. Maybe from the bathroom drawer or wherever you keep your magnifier. We're gonna do a real quick. And you might wanna hold your microphone closer to your mouth as you speak. Okay, is that better? And keep using that playground voice. <laughs> I'm just gonna be loud then, extra loud. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. And let me know when I can just... Slide. I will. Are you ready to move to the next slide? Uh, um, okay. Let, uh, no, not yet. Um, I uh, said just a minute ago that I think it is so cool to learn new things about the eye. I actually have a page in a folder where I collect eyeball facts. And that kind of led to these lessons because I'd be talking with students about their eye or cool things about the eye and I just kept learning and hearing new things. So that's kind of where this started for me. And I first want to say that I am not an eye doctor. Um, I think it's a really cool thing if you can um, get a chance to just uh, maybe get a group of students together and find a low vision specialist or an eye doctor who just ask me those questions you have about your eye. But um, I am just coming at this as somebody who finds the eye really cool to learn about. 
So I have a question. Uh, we need one particular thing for us to be able to see. So if we were all in a dark room, doors closed, no windows, none of us would be able to see. So what's the one thing that we need? And it's light. So we're going to talk about that a little bit when we're building the eye on how light has to pass through the eye. And you might have heard uh, the eye compared to a camera, like the lens of a camera and the light has to come in and it goes through the camera and then lands on the film. And that's where the image is captured. It's sort of like that, but our eye is so much more complex than that. So we're gonna talk about like the eye structure, how it works, activities that can help us learn more about the eye, and then maybe even some things after this lesson that you can go keep learning about, look up on your own, do with your parents or with your um, vision people um, as we're doing remote learning still. So on the next slide, um, I have the questions that are asking, who are you? And I'm curious on if you are a student and um, if you could type in the chat, because I'm curious, to, what's our mix today? Do we have lots of students? Do we have more parents or more VI professionals? And if you're a student, let us know if you're um, elementary level or secondary older. And we'll give just a, a minute for, for us to get a sense of who's in the lesson today. I am seeing lots of professionals, which we're used to, but we have high school, I see elementary school, I see a middle school, I see third grade, I see junior high, I see seventh grade, third grade, a parent with a four-year-old, fifth grade, ninth grade. And right. this is meant for those students. So welcome students and all of you professionals get to listen in the background. I love that we have such an age range. So with those students, I want to ask you the next question. Are you at number one, I'm new to learning about my eye. So you could say new to me in the chat, or I know the name of my eye condition. Or the third is I can even tell you more about it. I can tell you about my eye condition and the part of my eye that's affected by it. I see lots of new, one or two that they know their eye condition, they know the name, little in the middle. I know a little info. This is new to me. Great. Like two, I know the name, I know the condition. Okay, so on the next slide, it shows, and maybe you've done this before, if you have a magnifying mirror, and sometimes they're attached to the wall in the bathroom, but if you hold that magnifying mirror up to your eye, it makes your eye even bigger so you can see it more. And you're seeing probably the white around the outside that's called the sclera. Maybe I have some freckles right around under my eyelashes and I can see that dark spot in the center. And it's really personal because I have low vision too, I can't see people's eye colors. I'd have to get really close to their face to see it. But this magnifying mirror lets me look at the color of my eye and I have hazel eyes. And that's one cool thing about the eye. It's different for everybody. So if you have a magnifier, and this is something where you get to ask permission of somebody else, I can put the magnifier up to their eye and examine their eye. I mean, doctor, eye doctors do that. They have a magnifying lens that they're looking and maybe different family members would let you do it and be really cool if you have a pet, like a dog or a cat or even a turtle, that, will, that pet will let you examine their eyes. So that's just kind of a first step of really looking at the outside or the exterior of the eye and we can kind of have a sense of the different parts of it. 
So on the next slide, I have a question that is, why do you think it's important to know about how your eye works? And I have a picture of a student who is using, um, he has a, thre a 3D model of the eye. So it's, it's a shape, he can take it apart and put it back together. And whether you're blind or you have low vision or you have typical vision, I'd, I'd be curious to hear what others think about why do you think it's important to know about how your eye works? I'm gonna wait a minute and see what we get in the chat. It's um, your vision teacher, they might have an eye model in your district, a 3D eye model, but all of the eye doctor offices do, low vision specialists. So next time you go to the eye doctor, that may be a question to write down on your, your page of questions that you want to take in of, this is what I've been wondering about since my last appointment. And so the, Sanaya said it was for future use for jobs? Good, yes. We're gonna bring that up. And we have a couple of hands raised. Maybe uh, Cindy might wanna tell us. Cindy. Cindy. Not Cindy the presenter. But uh, Cindy. Yes, the other Cindy. <laughs> Cindy, you can kind of hold down your space bar depending on your computer system. Hmm, it's not, did you get it? She is having a hard time. Uh, Uriah, why is it important to know how your eye works? Hello? Hi, Uriah. Go ahead, Uriah. So I think because um, it's important to have vision. Vision is a helpful sense, but we all have different senses that we can use. So we're talking today about how the eye works and we'll get some reasons for why does it help us to know about that. And then one others was, so you can know what you need. Okay. So on the next slide, I put up three reasons that I think beyond just the cool facts that we learn, because our eyes are a part of us. And my eyes are different than anybody else's. And that fancy term, it's part of my self-identity. And knowing how my eye works and how it's different, how it's unique from other people around me. Um, I think it's important when you know about your eye that you can then start to develop a comfort level with being able to explain what, what happens in my eye condition. Why does that make my eye unique? Because I'll bet most of the students, there's been a time either at school or in a store, you've been asked kind of those awkward questions that your eyes look funny or why do your eyes do that? And being able to, as you choose, being able to explain something like nystagmus is a pretty common eye condition where the eyes move back and forth. And it's the brain. It's just a signal from the brain. And so I'm not weird. My, my brain just has this mechanism where it does that. And then the last reason I put down is that we can become confident in naming tools and strategies that even when I do have a visual impairment, I'm still able to be independent. I'm still able to do um, the same tasks as other people. And I think those are, when I can talk about my eye, I know the words to name the parts or I know about my eye condition. Because of all the students who are listening on, on the lesson today, there are hundreds and hundreds of different eye conditions. So. We're kind of talking about just the eye in general and maybe the uh, particular eye condition will come up as we're. Um, when I was talking with this lesson to, uh, to a friend about this lesson, she made a comment that it's important to be able to explain in some situations, like if you're asking for additional support or maybe additional equipment or technology, 
well, why? And so if, say, I'm in high school and I'm applying for an internship, for me to be able to talk about my potent to my potential employer, well, these are the tools I use, or this is the accommodation I'm going to ask for, and I'll be able to do the task. Then all of that is comes from starting to learn about your eye. So the next slide has four questions on it, and this might be something that students can do at home, or maybe with their vision teacher or their O and Emmer, their comms. And it's four questions that what makes my eyes unique? And there's a line for writing down the name of my eye condition is. And then there's probably a particular part of the eye. And when we build our model out of those household items, we'll mention some of that, the part of the eye that is affected. So for example, in my condition, that's ROP, retinopathy of prematurity, the retina is where um, the, the diff, my eye is different than, say, my sister's. Um, two ways that my vision is unique. So how my eye is set up, I can bring something in close and I actually see it pretty clearly because my eye acts like a magnifier. But things that are far away are harder for me to see. So you would have your own reasons for uh, two ways that my vision is unique. And then if you can think of what are three things that help me to see? And I'm gonna say my telescope, um, being able to get closer to something, and lighting. I said in the first at the very beginning that light is what we need to see and having good, comfortable lighting is something that I really like. So you would be able to fill these lines in on your own. So on the next slide, I'm gonna do just one page that talks about research. Because I think for us vision professionals, it's how are other, what do we know from other uh, VI professionals in the field? So about 25 years ago, two researchers asked students in Texas, and they wanted to know from this group of students, um, could they name their eye condition? and just over one third could, 34% of the group could. So two thirds of the group couldn't say the name of their eye condition. And then they asked, could they name a part of the eye that was affected? And only 13%, just over 10% could say, yep, I know what part of my eye. So we're gonna jump forward. So just nine years ago, a couple of other researchers, they asked the same question to a group of students, could they name their eye condition? And just nine years ago, only 35% of the group could. So 65% of the group didn't know. And then 16% of the students could give the name of their eye condition and explain what it meant. And I bet there's vision teachers out there who are saying, we've talked about this, I've gone over the eye. And I remember hearing a statistic that you have to hear something six times before you remember it. So this is one of those uh, lesson topics that it's really good to repeat. So on the next slide is kind of another futuristic of we, in medical science, we are learning so much more about the brain right now than any other time in human history. And the brain sits behind the eye and it's doing the heavy lifting. I would, I hope in the future, we can be doing lessons with students where we can build a model of the brain and show because the eye carries the signal but the brain translates the signal. It's doing the heavy lifting, and we call it the pathways. Pathways through the brain where that signal has to get to the right spots. And I heard one of our eye doctors say that over 60% of the brain is dedicated to sight. That is just, that's a huge part of the brain. Um, so we're gonna talk more about um, how the eyeball works, but the, to see something, to know what it is, that really happens in the brain. 
So on the next slide, it does show a diagram, the cross section of the eye, and there are some words on here that you might have even heard them, like iris is that colored ring part of your eye, and the cornea, sounds like corn, cornea is the front part of the eye, and we're going to talk more about that when we build the eye model. Um, vitreous is that this was one of the um, attachment or documents that um, if you're not seeing it on the screen, it is in the handouts that um, maybe you can even keep talking about and use later. So when we say that camera analogy, the light has to go through that front part, all through that vitreous section and then land on the back wall where it connects to the brain and we've got the optic nerve, that's one of the items labeled there. So these are some of the words that we're gonna talk a little more about. Um, and it's just, I, I read another st um, statistic that there are over 2 million parts that make up the eye. Talk about something that's complex, that has to qualify as complex. So the next slide, um, I found when I was working on lessons with students, uh, some resources online. And Kids Health is a site that just, it talks about uh, taking care of ourselves and how do we stay healthy. And in a minute, we're gonna start a video and I'm gonna introduce this. The two characters are Chloe and Nerve. And they do a really good job of giving description on this. So that's why I chose this video. And I really thank our archivist, Suzanne, who made sure that we had permission to show this one. And Chloe and the Nerve, they give a tour of the eyeball. And they start out playing a game of ping pong. And I thought, ah, that's interesting. They chose that because I've also heard that a ping pong ball is about the size of our eye. So we're going to go, if we can start that video, um, it's pretty short, I think maybe just four or five minutes, and they'll give us a tour of the eyeball. They also give us captioning, Belinda. Nerb, just because eyeballs are the size of ping pong balls doesn't mean they make good ping pong balls. A nerb cannot be blamed for his love of scientific exploration, my dear Chloe. It is what makes him a nerb. Then can we use the eyeballs to explore how an eyeball works instead? We could, but these are kind of small and... Squished. One might say that. How about we take a look at him? Most excellent idea! Let's do! The eyeball is a beautiful machine with lots of different parts working together to let you see. Poets say the eyes are the window to the soul. Well, the window to the eyeball is the cornea, a dome of clear tissue up in front of the eye that focuses light as it passes through. Look at that beautiful green eye, and brown eye, and blue eye. The colorful part is called the iris, right? Well, yep, it's right behind the cornea. In the middle of the iris is a black circle called the pupil, an opening that lets light into the eye. The iris has muscles attached to it that change its size, making the pupil bigger and smaller to control how much light gets through. So the pupil gets smaller when there's a lot of light and bigger when it's dimmer. Don't look now, but I think we're being watched. Mm. Oh, he blinked first. Which is a good thing. Blinking protects and moistens the eye. Good point. So what happens after the light has passed through the cornea and the pupil? The light passes through the lens. Like the lens in a camera? Precisely. The lens focuses the light onto the back of the eye, where seeing really starts to happen. Can the lens and the eye focus on stuff that's close and stuff that's far, like a camera lens would? 
It sure can! Let's head inside to see how! Last one through the pupils, rotten egg! The lens is held in place by a bunch of fibers which are attached to the ciliary muscle. Ciliary, ciliary, ciliary. The ciliary muscles change the shape of the lens to let the eye change its focus from something close by to something far away. What are you waiting for? Let's get focusing! To see something near, the ciliary muscle makes the lens thicker. To see something far, the ciliary muscle makes the lens thinner. From the lens, we travel to the retina, the back wall of the eyeball. Right, because the lens focuses the light onto the retina. The retina has millions of light-sensitive cells called rods and cones. About 120 million rods and 7 million cones in each eye. Whoa, that's a lot of rods and cones. What's the difference between them? It's the difference between black and white and color. The rods see in black, white, and shades of gray and help us see the shape and form of a thing. Rods also help us see in the dark. And the cones see color? Cones are sensitive to one of three colors, red, green, or blue. Together they let us see millions of colors. But cones need more light than rods to work well. Hey, what's this thing behind the retina? Hey, no bouncing on the optic nerve. It carries messages to the brain about what you're seeing. The rods and cones change the colors and shapes you see into millions of nerve messages. Then those messages are carried along the optic nerve to the brain. It's like your eye is sending the brain a report on what you're seeing. Then your brain translates the report into cat, apple, or bicycle. Or... A bing pong ball. Hmm? Keep your eye on the ball there, Nerb. Oh, <laughs> it's on. Thank you to Chloe and Nerb for giving us a tour of the eyeball. And they are using some of those same words that we are um, on the next slide. It has a list of the materials that hey, we have. A we're going to interrupt you because we have a number of people with their hands raised. Okay. Can we take a couple of questions before we move on? Sure. Okay. How about Miriam? Tell us what your question is. Press your space bar. She's having difficulty unmuting. Okay, maybe we'll try uh, Megan. Go ahead, Megan, you can press your space bar. Oh, she lowered her hand. Okay, okay Ruby. Ruby. <laughs> Well, I think a lot of people with their hands raised, but we can't get their questions uh, unless they write in the chat. I think there are two more hands raised. Haley? You can press your space bar. There Haley. you go. Try it. How did you know that I had a question? How Because you, you have your hand raised, Haley. That's how we know. Oh, my optic nerve doesn't work, so... Why do sometimes my eye like shake out of control? Why does it shake? Yeah, sometimes my eye blink weird. Maybe um, nystagmus. You no, know, if you're saying that you have nystagmus or you can just sometimes feel your eye moving. If like, no, like sometimes my friends say that uh, my eye are like, going weird like one's up and yeah, one's moving. Yeah, and that's the brain is sending a signal because it's trying to get that clearest vision for you. 
It's doing that shifting. So it's that mega computer. And that's not every brain does that. Bridge. I can only see light. Yep. They're just trying to find light in random places. You're searching, um, helping, trying to get you all the good information that the eye and the brain together can. Thank you for your question. Uh, let's see, we've got Sinaya. Hello. Go Hi ahead, there. Sanaya. Hey, I'm, I'm not gonna make this long, I'm sorry. Uh, so I lost my vision behind the, a brain tumor. Uh, the tumor sat there for a while, so it damaged my optic nerve. And I was just trying to see, uh, how does it go with uh, not having peripheral vision and I have no vision in my left eye. It's like really fuzzy, but my other eye is like, okay. And if what you were saying is that you don't have the peripheral or the side vision, but you do have the central. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So if everybody, if you cup your hand, make an O and put it in front of your eye, you have blocked out your side vision like Sanaya was describing. And it's, you can still see things in front of you, right? But you have to do really big turns to see things to the side. And we collect so much important information from the side. It tells us what's going on in our environment. If I hear a noise, my like uh, nerve was saying the rods will be able to detect, oh, that's a dog moving in my field. So that central vision helps, but we really do get a lot of information from the side vision. Thank you for your question. Tonight. Thank you. And we'll take our last question from Helena and then we'll get back to our activity. So hold down your space bar, Helena, please. Um, I got a question. Hello, okay. Uh, hello? Yes. Uh, um, uh, the objects to, can you, um, um, see on the microscope, like, let you see more better? Does it work with, with blind people? I don't Does know. Does it work with my reception? My sense is for a tip, a regular microscope, you have to have vision, but there are some interesting things being developed that can use like sonar and that's we <laughs> I don't have a great explanation of it but there are different ways to interpret things that are visually seen that could be interpreted through sound as well and and maybe some scientists are working on that kind of a microscope okay we're ready to move on Cindy okay so the materials are uh, a cereal bowl. A, if you have something that's shaped like a donut, you could even get a piece of paper, cut it a circle, and then cut a circle out in the middle of it. So it's like a donut. Um, and then a Ziploc bag. That's, you could reseal, fill it with air and reseal. And then a, kind of a squishy, maybe a three or a four inch round ball and a washcloth and either a pipe cleaner or a straw, even a pencil would work, a pen, something long and straight, and then a larger ball. So I have, and we can switch out of the slideshow, Leanne. I have my items gathered in a bag and I'm gonna pull the first item and we're gonna find, so I've got here, it's clear, it's, um, and put my hand behind it so you can kind of see it. Um, it's a clear bowl. And remember how Chloe and Nerve talked about the cornea is the front of the eye. And like a windshield, it stops things from getting in it. So I, for each of these items, I have something that it's compared to. So I think of the cornea as the windshield of the eye. And just like the windshield on a car, the bugs don't get in. So that's the cornea. And then my next item 
is, this is my, that's the lid to that bowl. And I put a piece of blue construction paper on it. And the hole in the middle is the pupil. That's the, where the light goes in. And remember the iris can change. Mine, I can't switch it like cloth, but it gets, if it's really bright out, your eye and the brain are going to say, whoa, too much light, make that a small, small hole. Or if you go in, like you walk into a dim movie theater, your pupil gets bigger to let more light in. So it's kind of a muscle that can change. And one of the cool things I heard was, the eye doctor, when they're looking at your eye and they're looking through the pupil, they're actually going all the way back to the retina and the optic nerve, which is part of the brain. So they're actually looking at your brain through that pupil. I thought that was pretty cool. And then next we have the, the lens. And here's my Ziploc bag filled with air and it's real squishy. And if you know, if somebody in your family or maybe you have ever worn a contact lens, it's real squishy and movable. And for the vision teacher, well, even students, Cheryl was telling us at the beginning that um, an Excel Academy student had dissected, I think it was a cow's eye. And if you take that lens out, it's very movable. And I call this the light bender because where the lens, lens sits in the eye. And if you think back to that uh, cross section, uh, the diagram of the eye, that's where the cornea gets it started, but then the light goes through this clear lens and goes back to, I've got my vitreous. And I didn't have a round ball about this size, so I just rolled up uh, plastic bags and put rubber bands around them. Um, and this is kind of thick. Uh, but that idea that all of these parts have to be clear so that the light can go through. And some students, they might have heard, like um, I do with ROP, even a lot of adults have floaters. So it's little flecks that break off and float through the vitreous. Um, my friend mentioned like a snow globe. If you shake up a snow globe, eventually it settles down but the brain detects that thing that can move through the vitreous. And then we have, what's after the, this, oh, I wanna make sure I'm not getting things out of order. So here I've got a cloth and I think of it, if you just lay it on your palm, that's like the back wall of the eye and remember, Nerve was talking about 120 million cells in the rods on the outside. And then that center spot is much smaller, has 7 million cells, the cones that let us see detail and color. And then to this cloth, I'm gonna connect my optic nerve that is leading to, and I've got a big, heavy, exercise ball, the brain. So all of these have to work together. And I think part of learning about the eye is knowing the order that the items come in. So the windshield, the cornea, the, cent the front of the eye, then the iris, the color ring, the light goes through the pupil, through the lens, through the vitreous, lands on the retina, goes through and the, the retina is like a net in Latin. That word actually means net. And I think of it as a net of cells that are catching those electric signals that pass through. Um, our doctor describes it like um, the wire cable connecting the cable in your house. Sometimes you get a fuzzy signal. You might still be able to see something on the TV screen, but it can be fuzzy, but you're still getting a signal and then it goes to the brain. So that's one way of, I think, demonstrating the eye. And the next slide asks you a question. So we built our human eye out of uh, things at home and we watched Chloe and Nerve 
And so I have two questions here. What did you learn that was surprising from either of these activities that we did? Or what are I parts that you want to learn more about? We had one come in the chat. It was like, I never knew where floaters actually were. It's, this is even something you can do when you, we get back to school, like with your classmates. To, so everybody knows, oh, mine, for my eye condition, the retina. It's just that my retina didn't develop fully. That's all. But I still am able to see things. And one person said the retina means that I want to learn more about the retina. A whole lot of things happen that happen there. There, Part that fancy eye doctor word is your uh, retinologist, who specialized just in uh, diseases of the retina. Parker goes. The rods are black and white, and the cones are color. Yep, all the colors that we can see, and that's just fascinating that the eye and the brain working together translate that. So I'm going to mention another eyeball activity. And Charlotte put, I think, the link for this in the chat that um, my friend Kathy Garza at work, we have um, the next slide shows an example of some students building an edible eyeball. How fun would that be? So just from what we, uh, as we were building the eyeball, you think about a lifesaver. It's a circle with a, uh, the middle is all empty. What part of the eye would that be? A lifesaver. Put your That's guess it. in the chat. What would that lifesaver be? Uh, Faith says an iris. Yep. Shaped like a donut. How about a licorice stick? What would the licorice stick be in those parts of the eye that we've been talking about? What would the licorice stick? Merrick says the optic nerve. Karen yeah, did too. Exactly. And the marshmallow. It's pretty big. What would the marshmallow be? Sanaya says the eye. Michelle says the vitreous. Vitreous. It's that big, bulky part of the eye. Exactly right. So another activity I do with students, the next slide, it has on the left the list of the uh, terms of the eye that we've been talking about. And then on the right, I do a, we play with the words. So like cornea, I cut it in half, C-O-R, NEA, and then I cut the word vitreous in half, and the word retina, and pupil, and all these syllables we mix up on the table, and then I start my timer, and I see how quickly can we all match up the, the word parts that go together. So cornea, vitreous, and if, if you did a minute and a half the first time, so you do it two more times and do you get faster at it? And what you're learning is how to, by saying these words out loud, you're seeing the letters in the order that they are for spelling it correctly. And it makes it so much easier for us to talk about. Like uh, somebody who has their eye condition is involved, the cornea is involved with uveitis or somebody who, if your lens is cloudy, that's a cataract. So there are all kinds of, and if I know how the parts of the eye work together, and then I know the part to name, the part of how my eye is different, then I'm able to do that really good job of very quickly being able to explain how my eye is different. So that's an activity that maybe if you're able, you could even print those word parts on scraps of paper and play that game. And it's just one more um, activity. So the next, um, when I was building these lessons for students, I came across a couple of websites. And a couple of 
them are, I, the, there are three links on this page. And the first and the third one are geared more towards, I'd say, uh, middle school and high school, some really great activities. But I wanna quickly show that second link or the first link under optics for kids because it has, and then you go to activities on the top toolbar and just down a little bit. And we're gonna look at just a real quick one activity, ages five and up. The smart people who put these websites together. And then over on the right is nail polish rainbow. And it will show you the directions for how to do this experiment and the real short list of items. So this is for all different ages. Um, they break these activities down. And I thought this was just a great example of being able to kind of do this on your own, taking more of the activity. So we can go back to, those are some websites that you might want to investigate more on your own. So when I was looking around on the web for more activities and things I could do with my students, how animals see kept coming up. And I thought, well, that's cool. because So then we can compare how our eyes work to how different animals see. And there are multiple different um, YouTube videos out there. We weren't able to show this first link, I'm gonna describe what he talks about. And I hope you can watch it because this guy, Anthony on Discovery News, he is really funny. He is very enthusiastic. And he, that human eyes are amazing. It gets even more <coughs> crazy in the animal world. And he gives examples like cats and dogs have fewer cones, but more rods and our rods see movement. So they are much more able to see, they see motion better than we do. And then he keeps talking about some other different animals, like the leaf-tailed gecko has, sees 350 times better than we do. I, I can't even understand what that means. And he gives some examples. Because they have vertical pupils, like it's a line going up and down, that they um, are able to see uh, better than, uh, differently than we do. And then they only have cones. So they see colors clearly, even in the dark. Imagine that, in a dark room that you could see colors. I just, his uh, explanations are really good. And then he goes to um, explaining that scientists are looking at the gecko eye and seeing if they can create new kinds of cameras based on how the gecko's eye is built. And even because it's multifocal, meaning it can focus on multiple things at the same time. And can we build a contact lens that is multifocal? And he gets really excited when he talks about the mantis shrimp. Super cool vision because it can see ultraviolet light infrared light, polarized light, it's, it's a fun video. So I, um, in my folder, I keep lists of some crazy animal eye facts. And I'm gonna give a couple of examples that I thought were really interesting. Like camels, they live in the desert where there's a lot of sand and camels have three eyelids to keep their eyes protected from all the blowing sand. And an ostrich eye, it's two inches across, but the eye weighs more than its brain weighs. And that's certainly not true for us. The giant squid has the largest eyeball on the face of the earth. It's about 18 inches across. It's about the size of a beach ball. You think about a beach ball and this is a giant squid and I looked that squid up and it's about the same uh, the shape and weight of a car. It's an animal that lives deep in the ocean and it has the biggest eyeball of anything on earth. Um, you think an owl 
its eyes are tubular shaped like a toilet paper tube and they the eyes can't shift that's why the owl can turn its neck so much but you think if you took a walk outside at night it's dark out and an owl is sitting in a tree and then you walk 150 steps forward and the only light out there is one candle and an owl can see a mouse at 150 yards away with just light that might be coming from a candle. And I am curious if that's, I just listed off some of the eyeball facts that I thought were really cool. Um, I'm curious if anybody in the chat has other eyeball facts. Either human eye, and then we all, I can add to my notes page, my trivia, and maybe other people want to start their notes page. Cindy, we did have a question in the chat uh, to find out if there's a place to go to see how to make the eyeball with a bowl. To make the eyeball with a bowl, like what you're doing. Um, in the resources, that was one of the documents. Um, I, we have an article on Texas sensibilities that describes that. And then I have, it was also published in JVID. So it, it kind of gives the whole set of instructions on that. And those should be handouts. And some of the things that are coming in are the eye is the second most complex organ in the body, second only to the brain. Ooh. Or goat's irises are horizontal. Did not know that. Uh, Wendy said a fly can detect the slightest movement. And I remember reading that the uh, flies have compound eyes, maybe in your earth science or biology class, the teachers talked about that. And how compound eye is different than our eye. Ours is not. Do you know why our eyesight gets worse as we get older? Because things get stiffer for us who are aging. It's the fancy term is presbyopia. The uh, lens is not as bendable and because it can't shift as much that's why when we get older more people are wearing glasses because those glasses help to get that light bent the right to the right spot to land on the retina where our lens used to do that when we were younger and it was more plastic more flexible Faith said when she dissected cow's eyes, the lens actually bounced a bit. <laughs> That's a great example. Yeah. Talk about um, flexibility. I was reading up more on the human eye and the, the muscle, the, your, the eye muscle are the most active muscles in your body and they are the strongest. They are 100 times more powerful than they need to be. And you think of all the things the eye does, that those muscles are constantly moving. And one of the items I didn't include, um, the articles that talk about this, you can use up to 10 students to build an eye because we stand up and hold up the objects when I do this in a group. Or if you build two eyes, you can involve about 20 students and then a stretchy exercise band gets to be the muscles of the eye. So you can have a couple of different students holding up uh, where they make the eye go lower or higher or forwards or backwards. So there's lots of ways to play with this. And one more interesting fact, horses see different things through each eye so they can see if they're being attacked by a predator. Huh. So you've got more you. facts to add to your list. Thank you, I love that. And there's different books, a librarian um, 
may be able to help you. If you like that learning about the animal eyes, there's lots of that out there. So almost our last slide is your ideas or activities you've done for learning more about the eye. I don't know if maybe uh, some students have ideas or if the vision professionals have some. When I was doing these activities with students, we kept it going. Once a week, we'd do a lesson for about two to two and a half months because they just kept asking questions. I loved it. I was learning so much. I'm not seeing any yet, but one of the ones I use was to learn about the bones of the eye. We would make a puzzle out of cardboard to push the bones of the eye together. Wonderful. Some that I have done with students, you could make your, that cross section of the eye, that slide that had that, you could make your own picture of the eye. Or Sharon you, takes a picture of the student's eye with the iPad so they can look at it up really close. It's a great idea. And you can zoom in, <laughs> truly zoom in. You can write down your own explanation of your eye condition. Maybe work with your vision teacher or go to really reliable sites like National Eye Institute or Lighthouse. We'll talk about different eye conditions. Uh, Dewey says label parts of the eye on a diagram of the eye. If you cover up those words on that cross section and then the student will write out, you point to one part, what's this? And it's after you practice those words that have been cut apart and put back together. I can even spell it right. My favorite activity is finding an eye doctor, a low vision specialist maybe, who if I can get a group of students together, and this is something we could do through Zoom, is ask all those questions I've I've wondered about my eyes. Because sometimes parents do a lot of the talking in an eye appointment. Um, and I like it when the students are able to ask the doctor. We get our doctor in the room and she, the students can go for more than an hour asking questions. So I'm gonna move you to your last slide. And I, uh, picture I have on here, let's, uh, it says lots more to learn about the eye. My students would, I made a um, enlarged diagram, cross section of the eye, and the students would do their own presentation. They would, my name is, and they give a quick explanation of how the eye worked. My eye condition is, talk about that, some of the tools I use, and so they practice, and everybody was able to stand up and do their two minute presentation. And then on the right side, our students gathered around a contrast sensitivity chart that uh, the doctor, Dr. Miller, is talking to the students about how the doctor reads that and how it's helpful. And I, I thank you so much for joining this Zoom lesson today. And I love the animal facts that you all shared. I get to add to my list. Um, and we all get to go keep learning about the eye. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. We have a lot of comments coming in. Thank you. Thank you for the great info and activities. Um, thank you from Dewey. Thank you from Lisa. We really enjoyed the lesson and learned a lot. And I encourage all of you at home for you to learn more about your eye too. It is so empowering for you to be able to tell us about your vision and how you see and if you know your eye condition, what that means. So I encourage you all to learn about yourself after this lesson. Have a wonderful rest. Oh, let me, before we go, let me tell you what's happening tomorrow. Robin Keating Clark will be back again for a second part two of the community's con connections. And uh, she will be joining us tomorrow. So we hope that you are able to be with us tomorrow for that session. Thank you again, Cindy. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Belinda. Thank you, Charlotte. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.